Hi, I'm Brendan Kane, the author of One Million Followers, How I Built a Massive Social Audience in 30 Days. And on today's show, we're gonna talk about how I actually was able to generate a million followers in 30 days and how you can leverage social media to your benefit to grow your personal brand, your business, or reach any of the goals that you're trying to reach. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, is the founder of FullMontyLeadership.com. He's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dov Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dov Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of leadership excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Dov Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives, part of the Full Monty Interview Series. I'm your host, Dov Barron, founder of Full Monty Leadership, and I'm here to assist you tapping into the one thing in your business that changes absolutely everything. Let me ask you, are you committed to up-leveling your leadership? Well, today we ask, as a leader, does social media matter? Is it just a bunch of kids looking for validation, or is it now power and leverage? Well, you'll have to catch this episode to find out. Remember, you can chat about this episode or any past episodes on our Facebook page. Simply look for Dove Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Podcast right there on Facebook. If you're a new listener, new viewer, thank you for joining us. Strap yourself in. We're about to go full Monty. As always, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you tune into podcasts. We're always just so grateful to have your help in keeping us relevant. So please get yourself over to iTunes, rate, review, or subscribe to the show. And you can do that on wherever you traditionally tune into podcasts. You can also catch us on traditional radio stations across the United States every Monday and Thursday and you can find us all the way from, I don't know, Colorado to Philadelphia. Uh, look for us also on Roku TV, on Roku TV, where there's over 100,000 subscribers. If you're a regular listener, regular viewer, big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners with a reach of about 2.5 to 4 million listeners for every single show. We're honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. And did you know you can also tune to us, tune into us on Spotify, Google Home, and Alexa simply by saying play Dog Baron Podcast. Again, thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. As a leader, whether you are a CEO, C-suite leader, sales leader, entrepreneur, leader in any capacity, you know that entrepreneurs have become today's rock stars. They have created leverage and fame via social media. In fact, some of them are simply famous for being famous. But does that mean we should ignore social media? The bigger question is, should social media matter to you as a leader? Is it, as I said earlier, just a bunch of kids looking for validation, or is it now the power and leverage, power and leverage that if you disrespect it will have you eating your competitors' dirt? Well, let's find out together. My guest on this show is Brendan Kane. Brendan Kane is a business and digital strategist for Fortune 500 corporations, brands, and celebrities. He thrives on helping his clients systematically find and engage new audiences and the, the leverage the relevant content products and services of, and to keep their attention and keep that attention being spent on his clients. Brendan's greatest strength is unlocking value. He transforms complexity into simplicity with tools and methods that amplify growth and enable execution. He started his career at Lakeshore Entertainment. You might know who that is because you've been to the movies. Brendan oversaw all the aspects of their interactive media strategies. He worked on 16 films that generated worldwide gross of 60, 658, $685 million and pioneered the first ever influencer campaign to effectively promote Lakeshore's movies. He also served as vice president of digital for Paramount Pictures and helped scale one of the largest social organizational optimization films in the world that worked with brands such as, wait for it, Disney, Fox, NBC, Netflix, Xbox, LinkedIn, and many other notable Fortune 100 companies. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and help me to welcome digital and business strategist for Fortune 500 companies, brands, and celebrities, Mr. Brendan Payne. And the crowd goes wild. Good to have you here, mate. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, me too. I'm very much looking forward to this. So, you know, let's go a little bit off book to start. Who is someone who likely we wouldn't know who's been a major influence on your life? Somebody we might probably not know of. Somebody that really impacted you in the way you see the world, in the way you see life. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty remarkable. I've been blessed to have a few different really solid mentors over the years. I mean, I think that the first mentor I had was the president of Lakeshore Entertainment was the first studio that I worked at Wow, that will really – kind of shepherd me and he was the president of paramount at one point at, early in his career he was an agent that represented he founded like kevin Costner and michelle pfeiffer and luckily he kind of showed me the ropes of the entertainment industry very early on and today i have another mentor that is one of the top entertainment managers in hollywood that represents nicole kidman angeline jolie billy bob thornton and really guides me on how to navigate just business and growth on a daily basis and to me, it's just to have that sounding board with somebody that has that level of experience is, is truly remarkable and helps in, in really the difficult times and the difficult decisions that you have to make throughout business. What's, what's, what's one, one thing from that, you know, you talked about two particular mentors there, but what's one thing about the way they've changed the way you look at life, not just at your career, but have they influenced the way you see life at all? I would say definitely, I would say patience is the biggest thing. It was very early on when I started my career, I was just not patient at all. I, I felt like everything had to happen very quickly and I was pushing to make things happen quickly and really struggled and still work on it today. I'm just letting go a little bit and you know, putting stuff out there that it means you still work hard, but at some point you've got to just kind of let things go. And if it comes back or if it happens, great. But if it doesn't, then it's, it's just not meant to happen. So I think that that's, one of the most valuable lessons that I had to learn very early on in my career. I find that the, the, the fact that you, le you had to learn patience fascinating, particularly because the title of your book is One Million Followers, and it's How I Built a Massive Social Following in 30 Days. But you should be patient. Only, you know, wait 30 days to get a million. <laughs> yeah, I mean, wait 30 I years to get a million. <laughs> But it's interesting because my background in the world that I come from really pushed me into that. So when you talk about the movie industry, for example, yeah, most movies that you promote are not sequels. Obviously, the Avengers that they've been working on that, yeah. you know, since the very first Iron Man for 15 years. So that's a little bit different. But when you're talking about most movies, you have to create a brand in like two or three months. Like you have right. to reach tens of millions of people in a very short period of time. And it's also when you're working with big corporations or big celebrities, yep. they're at a scale that, oh, you can't just reach a few thousand people and have success. Like you need to reach tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people to have an impact. Yeah. So that is really shifted. I, I wouldn't say even shifted. It's starting out from my career as setting my mindset around this concept of massive growth, massive reach in the shortest time period possible. Because I was always tasked with that in the jobs that I had to do. Yeah, I, 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 like when I think about those things, it's, it's just, a, like you said, you know, I think that we, you know, we hear about these budgets for movies, but we forget about how much is spent on getting you to that movie or getting that movie watched. So obviously that's a skill set that's very different. Um, you've worked with company, you know, we, we talked about um, this idea that social media is often ignored by leaders. You've worked with companies like Disney, Fox, MSNBC, Netflix, Xbox, LinkedIn, as I said, many others. Tell us why social media isn't just for kids um, who want a dopamine hit from another like and why it is so vitally important for leaders today. Well, I would say that, like you said, it's not just for kids because you see it in the, in the data. I mean, there's like you talk about Facebook, there's 2.2 billion people on the platform. YouTube, there's 2 billion people viewing content on those platforms worldwide and every demographics on it. And mm -hmm. 
listen, can you have success without social media? Sure, you can have success doing any number of different ways. But if you look at the numbers, you look at the success, the fact that Facebook in Q4 of last year generated $17 billion just in that quarter, yeah. and 99% of that is off of advertising revenue. Why is that? It's because the platform works. Mm -hmm. Like it's a marketing engine and people literally, the beauty of, of social and digital platforms is it's a true attribution model. It's like you put a dollar in and you know how much you get out. And where that real scale and amplification comes from is the people that really engineer it where they know if I put a dollar in for every dollar I put in, I get a dollar 50 in return or I get a $2 in return. And that's where you see companies like billion dollar valuations created in years instead of decades. Yeah. They have this systematic process that scales. And that's like interesting when you talk about the movie industry It's one of the areas that they struggle is because a majority of their advertising is still television and that's where the majority of the budget is. And there's no direct attribution model because the point of sale is still at the box office. Mm -hmm. So you can spend all this money on television advertising and not know exactly what the attribution is versus with social media and digital, then you tie it to an online purchaser, an online sale, you can really scale. So that's where you very early on, like Zanga, the, 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 the gaming company that created Farmville and all those companies, that's where they scaled so quickly because they had this engine and why mobile games are so successful is because right. they just got that science down. And there's another e-commerce company called Wish that, that scaled to a billion dollar valuation quickly because they had this model down. So it's, it's really amazing with the level of scale that you can reach if you know how to use social and digital platforms properly. So I think that there's still a lot of leaders out there that think of social media as a place to show pictures of your breakfast you know, and, and puppy pictures and kitten pictures, et cetera. But as you said, it's, it is a major business um, venture now. And we know that the older demographic are, are the fastest growing demographic on Facebook, for instance, even Instagram is because, you know, which was, you know, seen as much younger. Cause well, I remember when I first came on Facebook, I had no interest in coming on Facebook because it was college. You know, yeah. and then and then I realized, oh no, it's moving out of college. It's different, and I got on. I had no interest in Twitter because I'm like, you know, I don't care if you just took a dump. Who cares? Because it seemed to be that's what people were just tweeting whatever came to their mind in that 140 characters. So I don't care. And then I saw it was business, and I went on. You know, and the same thing with Instagram. And now I'm seeing, hold on, it's business. And so each one of these seems to evolve into business. And you know, it comes out in a in the younger demographic, and then it moves up into business. And, and like Gary Vaynerchuk says, uh, marketers ruin everything. So marketers, you know, they jump on and they realize this is a, a way to, to get the word to business. But I meet, uh, I was working with a, a company, an executive team last week, a week before, you know, and the, the, ex the senior executive founder who is uh, 67 said, you know, I'm not on Facebook. I don't have any interest in all that. And I started to talk to him about, influence and all that and by the end of our conversation he was like we got to have a social media marketer and he wanted to, because he understood and this is one of the things i really like about it is it's a way to tell the story of your differentiation how you separate yourself from others can you help us to understand that a little bit better that how to tell your story from a point of differentiation as a business a hundred percent. And it's, a, it's funny that you mentioned that because that's the second book that I'm working on right now, because I think it's so critically important. The reality of the situation is, is because of social media, we live in a three second world. It's yeah. it trained our brain to a much more uh, shorter attention span. Mm -hmm. And there's over 60 billion messages sent on digital platforms each day. Like, wow, so 60 much, billion. Yes. Across social media, emails, tax, all of that, 60 billion across the world. Wow. And because of that, there's so much noise. And like you have to find a way to stand out to really succeed because otherwise people are just going to keep swiping through their feed or they're going to go to their email. They're going to go to their text message. And it's one of the things that I focused heavily on. So I worked with a, a journalist called Katie Couric, who's, who's very big here in the United States and spent about two years uh, with her reverse engineering the art of the interview for social and digital platforms and had to get really good at understanding hook points and how to grab people in. So I did about 220 different interviews with her from like a Chance the Rapper to a Joe Biden to a Jay Leno 
to a Jessica Chastain, all these different celebrities. And through 220 interviews, we tested about 75,000 variations of hook points and content. So one of the, the exercises that I have developed and work with on clients uh, that, that I'm sure I heard it from someplace else, but I kind of modeled it specifically to this because it's so relevant is that let's just say that you are given the cover of a magazine or newspaper in your specific niche. And it's just your cover. Nobody else is on it. And the editor right. calls you and says, Hey, listen, we need, we're giving you this cover and we need less than one sentence, what you want your headline to be for that. And when you're coming up with that headline, imagine your core audience or customer walking down a busy street, passing a magazine stand, and there's 50 other magazines on that stand. What is that headline that is going to make them stop as they're walking down that busy street, pick yours out of 50 others, pick it up, buy it, and then read it because it's that difficult. Mm. So the exercise we do is we say, okay, create anywhere between five to 25 of those different headlines. Don't just come up with one, mm -hmm. come up with as many as that you can think of. And then through the testing process and through social media and through digital platforms, the beauty of it is you can test all of those against each other. And then you can measure the response of which one is really your differentiator, which one is going to make somebody stop and click, share, buy, register, whatever your core interaction model is. And that's where I think that a lot of people go wrong with social media is they get so caught up in their head about what they think is right. Yeah. And they invest all this time and energy into this single direction instead of, okay, here's 20 different options. Let me test them all against each other and let the audience tell me which one's really going to resonate. Yeah, that, that's, that's powerful. So it's a, that's the interesting thing about it is it's not those random surveys. You can actually get direct feedback right yeah. away immediately. And, and, and let's face it, it's one of the things that people still actually don't mind spending time on is doing some random survey. And now, cause you can click and do it very quickly. It's easy. Um, we, I'm developing a new podcast and in the new podcast, we are like, I, I had four titles. We worked through them and like, okay, mm, we boiled it down to, to two. We put them up on social media and said, put yours on whatever you think. If you think there's a better title, tell us what it is. And you know, the responses are pouring in. And the one that I was like, yeah, I don't know. The one that I was like, yeah, that's the one is the one if that one's scoring about medium. But the one that was like, yeah, I'm not so sure is the one that's scoring very high. And this is why it's so fabulous because it's a testing ground, right? A hundred percent. And the way that I look at it is I, I actually take it to a much more extreme level where I don't even survey people. I push the content out and just wow. see what they do when they respond to it. Right. So you can take one video, like for example, take one video and there's called meme cards, like the burned in text at the top or the captions at the bottom. The reason they do that is like 70% of video on Facebook and Instagram is watched with the sound off. Right. So that really captures that three seconds. So you literally, literally can take the exact same video and put a different meme card on each one and test them against each other in real time. So what Facebook did is they built their ad platform around something called a dark post, which means that you don't have to post something to your main feed. Mm -hmm. you can, it's still a post through your account, but it's, it's happening in the background. Right. So what you can do is you can send out hundreds of variations of a single piece of content in the background to specific audiences. You can control the, the demographics, the interest level, like what products and services, what competitors, geolocation down to the specific zip code, and all these variables, you can take one piece of content and test it a hundred different ways to figure out which way is the best way to maximize the potential of it. Yeah. And that's where it's like when you talk about market research, especially where in the movie industry, I, I, I shifted that thinking of what people say and what people do are two totally different things. Like Absolutely. Ask, asking them a question about what they would do versus pushing something out there and measuring the response. It's night and day about what, what type of data that you get from it. Yeah. That's fabulous. So tell us why you decided that you wanted to generate a million followers in 30 days. I mean, because it seems kind of a random thing to most of us. Um, you know, it's an arbitrary number, a million, and it's, it's a massive arbitrary number, but still an arbitrary number. Why, why a million people in, in, in 30 days? Why do you decide on that? Because of exactly what we talked about. I only did it for one single purpose because it was a hook point. It was a strong mm -hmm. hook point. 
that I knew that, first off, I knew I could do it because I had been developing these testing methodologies for, the, for years and working with celebrities and athletes. And I talked to a literary agent. I was like, hey, if I do this, could I turn this into a book and get a publishing deal? And he's like, yes. So that's kind of, I knew it was a strong hook point that you could build a foundation from. And that's, that's exactly why I did it. But also I had spent all these years working with the biggest names in entertainment, whether that's like a Taylor Swift or doing deals with like an MTV or a Paramount. But I also wanted to demonstrate the power of social media for the individual that's starting from scratch, whether it's a brand, a non-for-profit or a personal brand, because it's great to help like a Taylor Swift or an MTV, but what about the rest of us? Right. And I really wanted to provide a, a case study to demonstrate the power of if you have the right strategy, the right testing methodologies, the right content, the level of scale that you can do. So first started off, I did that 30 days with Facebook and now I'm focused in on Instagram and, and reverse engineered the system that I developed for Facebook for Instagram now. And we're seeing dramatic growth there. We're generating between 120 to 170,000 followers a month in growth for my channel right now. Crazy. Uh, so, and that, the goal is to hit a million and we'll hit a million within the next three months. So potentially within close to when the pot, this podcast comes out, I'll be pretty close to that. That's amazing. So for those who, again, are still not familiar with this um, for whatever their own bias has been, I know I had mine many years ago. Um, why would, uh, let's pick something random. Why would a pipe fitting company say, okay, why do I need a million followers? Why would I, pursue that goal uh, of having a mi million followers on social media uh, as a, as a pipe fitting company? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, first off, like the, the hook point of a million followers in 30 days is just that it's a hook point sure. to bring you in so that we can teach you the real fundamentals of how social media works. And that doesn't mean that everybody needs a million followers or any, no. everybody should go after that. So you bring up a great point. Like there's two different paths you can go on. Like, so the, the, the pipe fitting path, like it's just about getting customers. Like yes. you don't care about followers. It's like, it's lead generation, it's customer acquisition. So the strategy that I would develop for them is look at all of the direct response channels is, so you have Google AdWords, you have Yelp's ad platform, you have uh, Facebook ads, Instagram ads. So go off and focus on the best way to acquire those new leads and customers. And nobody really wants to, to follow a pipe fitting co uh, company's page. So it's just all about lead generation, but you can still use social to drive those leads. You just don't have to generate followers versus if you are a musician, an author, an athlete, or somebody that, that brand perception and audience really amplifies your overall value, whether mm -hmm. that is getting strategic business deals, endorsements, uh, influencer deals, whatever that is, then the follower numbers become more important. Now there are some hybrids. So there are certain like e-commerce companies that are national or international e-commerce companies. And they're still where I suggest to start on the direct response side, mm -hmm. generate revenue, generate profit, and then reinvest that profit into generating, generating meaningful followers, but not start with the followers. Right. Yeah. It's interesting because, um, like I said, I work with all kinds of different companies. And one of the companies that I was just talking to you about a few minutes ago, um, and they were saying, you know, with, with our industry, why would we bother? And, and I said, um, because you have a story. And, and I think that this is, you know, people will not follow, as you said, a pipe fitting company as such, but they will follow the story of that and the people behind that and the stories of the people behind that. And it's one of the things that I, I love about, social media is it's created transparency it's forced transparency on companies that wouldn't normally have it and allowed us to connect with the humans inside rather than just the the name and 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 i think that the smart companies are really understanding that and saying you know we don't just want to be the ceo we want to interview the person who is on the front desk at xyz company the person who was the receptionist, let's interview Sally or John and say, you know, why do you work here? And have yeah. them tell their story. And that, that, wow, I'm interested in that company now. And I just think it's so, I love the storytelling of it. Um, Cause I teach storytelling, but I do love the storytelling of it. Why that's an important piece. 
coming to that, um, you mentioned something uh, in passing there, which was paid ads, whether that's Facebook ads or Google ads or whatever it is. Um, and, you know, I, part of the perception of a million followers on social media is that it's somewhat magical, you know, in the, you, you, you do the right thing you do by the right thing. I mean, that could be something that is the wrong thing. You do something that will create infamy, but you do something that will create a lot of attention and you get a million followers or you do a series of those things. And I think that that's possible, but not regular. So is it possible to get there without the ads? Is it possible, for, uh, you know, for the person who's, oh, let's say somebody who's an entrepreneur, as you said, starting out, um, who isn't known, who doesn't have a major budget, who says, you know, I could spend a hundred bucks a week if I had to spend some money, a hundred bucks a week, or maybe even less. I don't know. Is it possible? Yes, it's definitely possible. I mean, in my book, I interviewed an influencer that was able to generate 15 million followers in 15 months, really at the and that was all, all organic. And, you know, I have a buddy that I moved out to here at LA that built a business that's generating three and a half billion views a month, all organically. Wow. What it comes down to at the end of the day is content. It's just like the better that your content is, the more organic growth that you're going to have. And even if you're using paid advertising, you still need to have solid content. So let's just take a talk about the movie industry again. It's like Avengers the last movie, they probably spent 150 to $200 million marketing that movie. Mm -hmm. Now that's a huge number that they spent marketing that movie and you look and it's paying off. But of if the movie wasn't good, like it doesn't matter how much money you spend, you see movies fail all the time where sure. they'll spend a hundred million dollars promoting it and people won't go and see it and it won't be profitable. It comes down to content at the end of the day. But I think that the most important question to ask yourself first before asking how much I'm going to invest is what is my return on investment going to be? Mm -hmm. Like what is the ultimate goal or outcome that I'm going to get from this? And again, right. that doesn't necessarily have to be a direct attribution to sales. It could be, I'm going to get a publishing deal. I'm going to get a record deal. I'm going to get an endorsement deal as an athlete or my next contract. I'm going to be able to increase my rate by whatever that is, or it can be a direct attribution for, okay, every dollar I spend, I'm going to get $50 in return. That's what I need to be, or it's a dollar 50 in return. So knowing that going in will dictate how much money and time you're willing to invest. And I see too many people go into this saying, I'm only willing to invest a hundred dollars a week or a thousand dollars a month or whatever that is without understanding. Okay. If I, cause I'll give you an example as I'm running Amazon ads right now, very successfully on Amazon ads for my book and, and promoting my book there right. and we hit a cap where we can't spend any more money. Like, we look for opportunities and this is the kind of mind shift uh, that I go through with my companies that I work with is one in particular, I'm working with one of the largest vitamin supplement companies in the world. And I see this in the corporate world all the time is like, okay, my budget is a hundred thousand dollars for the year or whatever that is. And it's the same right. for small businesses or entrepreneurs. Sure. They get so stuck in this mindset is this is my budget. Where I like to do is break that mindset and say, how can we get into a place where, we're not saying this is my budget, but we're saying how much can we spend? Mm -hmm. Like how much, how much can we fuel this growth? Because those are the companies that are succeeding. Those are the companies that are generating billion dollar valuations. Those are the influencers that scale to remarkable feats. It's how I generated a million followers in 30 days. Or, but shifting that mindset of like, okay, I can only spend a hundred dollars a month or $10,000 a month or whatever that is instead of reverse engineering it into what that attribution and that success looks like. So you can break that equation. But that comes back to what you were saying before about, about testing, because if somebody's starting out and saying, okay, I, I can spend a hundred bucks a month. Let's just use that a right, hundred bucks a month. I'm going to spend a hundred bucks a month, but it's not about throwing a hundred bucks a month at it. It's about seeing what that does. Because if you're spending a hundred bucks and it made you 150, then you can spend more. Yeah. And so what you're saying is test it because if you're spending a hundred bucks a month and you're getting $20 worth of value, then that's not good. But if you're spending a hundred bucks a month and then you get $150 worth of value, then a hundred bucks a month is not your limit. It's so you're t talking about testing it and finding out whether, because it's really about what is the ROI? What's the return on your investment? 
that's it. It's not actually about the budget. It's about the ROI. So if the ROI that you're looking for is followers or the ROI is looking for sponsors or looking for customers or looking for buyers, that's how you measure it. And that's what's more important than just saying, this is my, my, my ad budget, right? A hundred percent is, yeah. is on the attribution tie side, you're constantly testing and learning. And even if you're spending a hundred and getting 150 in return, it's how do I max, how do I push that further? How do I prove how do I push it from a hundred to getting $300 in return and constantly optimizing that process? Right. On the other side of things, like specifically for my case and building my brand, there's not really a direct attribution to revenue. I'm looking at the longer term play and this is where kind of followers and audiences come into play is, is really through looking at the long term play of building a media company of building a media agent or not an agency, but a media presence where I could be touching somebody today that could turn into a customer three years down the line yeah, and flipping the model of instead of business of going out there and, and essentially, uh, and essentially trying to earn and, and receive or go out and hustle every client, having clients or potential deal flow coming to you. Exactly. Now, one of the things you talked about earlier, um, which I think is, a very confusing point for many many people, which is content. You've got to be producing great content. Um, And as you said, it's a three second world um, with a lot of noise. What did you say? 60 billion digital messages a day. I mean, that that's insane, right? So how do, how do we, uh, as in the person who's now embracing this idea, how do we, how do we know what's good content? How do we know, um, to the, the thing we're doing is going to work. Well, I think that one of the, the best places to start, or one of the areas that I start with, with my clients is doing a competitive analysis. Like if you're just starting out, look at who's currently reaching your audience and do an analysis of the content themes, formats, and stories that they're using in order to have success. Understand why one piece of content was shared 10,000 times versus another piece of content was just shared once and really become a student of what other people are doing in that space, because that will be your guiding light of where do I start and what are the formats and themes that I currently use going forward. And then from there, then you can plug in your own content and, and really have your messages, your themes and stories in there. And then from there, that's where you can really test and learn. You know, I just think, you know, I, I, I've had that conversation with people many times and it seems like good content is very specific to the audience that you're serving. Like, you know, good content to Kim Kardashian's fans would not be good content to my audience or vice versa, or your, even your audience probably, you know, so it's, yeah. so how do we, how do we, how do we work that out? inside of our industry, uh, you know, my industry is leadership. Somebody else's industry is pipe fitting. Uh, somebody else's industry is cosmetics. How do we find out? Well, again, it's, it's starting with who making a list of all of the people that are speaking to your audience. So if you're in, in fashion or beauty, who are the top fashion or influencers? And I'm not talking about the outliers. Like you're right. No. You don't want to look at Kim Kardashian. You want to look at like an influencer that has, between maybe like a hundred thousand to a million followers. That's not on television. That's not on, on radio that purely grew their audience from social or digital platforms. Mm-hmm. And then from there, then you can start dissecting what is working from them. But mm-hmm. again, what's working for them may not necessarily work for you. And I'm not talking like copy it. I'm, I'm talking more about the formats. Right. The framework. All right. Are they, are they doing video? Are they doing photos? Like what types of formats are they using? Are they using meme cards? Are they using captions? and really becoming a student of that and then putting your content into it and testing and learning though. Because again, going back to the importance of testing is there's so many intricate details that can impact the success. So I, I just hired a creative director uh, for my company and my brand that, that comes from a company that was a competitor to Buzzfeed and they were generating about 3 billion views a month organically in videos. Wow. And he breaks down the systematic process that they go to. They, they look at the first three seconds. They look at the, the color of the lighting. They look at the color of the tables. They look at all these different variables wow. to really reverse engineer 
success. Now they're going at the highest level. Like their benchmark for success on a video is if it's generating anything less than 30 million views, it's not successful. So you don't have to take it to that level of extreme. I but, would kind of like that. Yeah. But <laughs> I, would, I would like to have their version of failure actually. <laughs> but it's, but it's, it's just understanding that, that mindset and that process going into it of paying attention to the intricate details of how people are structuring their content and learning from them to, to start yourself off. And then when you're in that process, testing and learning yourself. This, as you know, we've, we've talked about uh, LinkedIn. Uh, we talked about Facebook. We talked about Instagram. And, and most of our listeners here would probably be more likely to be on in, uh, LinkedIn, um, which, you know, for many people was seen as in the early days as a sort of HR platform, a place where you went to look for jobs and, you know, and, and now it's become much more than that. It is a business influencer platform, um, which I'm very, very involved in and have been for some time. Um, first question is, does the three second rule still apply there? And if, cause I know you've written a whole section on LinkedIn inside the book. Um, does the three second rule still apply there? And if it does, what would be your best tip for a business person um, to how to grab that first three seconds to, you know, to pull them in? Yeah. I mean, first off the three second rule definitely still applies because you have a scrolling feed, you have all this message, you're still competing against the 60 billion messages out there. And I've, had tremendous success on LinkedIn. I mean, I've closed tens of millions of dollars in business development deals there. Wow. And to me, and that's where I've closed some of the biggest clients. Like I closed Disney, Xbox, Fox off of cold outreach on those platforms. And it's amazing because I think that they're like the analogy that I use is we all hate telemarketers. We hate people that are calling us, especially on our phones. Now it's just becoming rampant. They call us, they're just trying to sell us something. Mm -hmm. And everybody hates, it. I don't know anybody that, that likes those calls. Ooh, call me now. I'm having dinner. <laughs> exactly. And yet, and yet when it comes to LinkedIn and people trying to market themselves, they take the exact same approach as a telemarketer is I just want to sell you something. Right. Versus the, the way that I've had success is not about trying to sell somebody on something is how can I provide the most value? It's like it, people, people hate to be sold to, but they love to buy. Yes. So, taking that position of how can I structure the most valuable content to this strategic business audience in a way that I'm providing value. Now that can come in one of two ways that can come through a video of you talking or content that you're pushing, or it can come th through a direct message of you trying to connect with somebody about how you can provide value to them. But really the, when you're talking about like video content, again, that first three seconds is super critical. So it's like, how are you going to set that clear expectation of what you're trying to communicate to people and then delivering on that communication? So if you're saying that, Hey, I'm in this video, I'm going to show you how to grow Instagram or something that's providing value. And then you actually deliver on that. That's where you're going to have more success. And the way that we look at video content, not just on Facebook or Instagram, but on LinkedIn is you use that first three seconds to earn the right for 10 more seconds for 15 more seconds, for 30 more seconds. And think about communication design in that way. And it is really communication design when you're producing content for that platform. And then with the direct messages and, and outreach to people, it's just like understanding your audience. Like, who are you talking to? Right. And make sure you're crafting that message specific to that person. It's like the CEO of a company views their goals and objectives and obstacles much more differently than a VP of marketing or yep. a middle manager. And people yeah. like forget that or don't even know that. And they just send a, a, a blanket message to everybody. And it doesn't really speak to somebody's pain point. Right. So um, I'm just trying to help people here who are, who are new to this. So if this was uh, LinkedIn, for instance, um, I would put forward and you, I want your feedback on um, create something that is in that first three, if you're going to do video, something in that first three seconds that is uh, emotionally evocative or um, directly um, uh, value-based, meaning, so it might start with, I'm just making stuff up here, but it might start with, uh, in this video, in, uh, in the next three minutes, I'm going to teach you how to X, Y, Z, right? There's a value statement within three seconds. Um, or... Um, uh, 
you know, the old copy line, which is, uh, they laughed when I said, right? You know, you start with something that is emotionally evocative. Um, is, is that still the right approach, those two things, or is it something else altogether? Yeah, it can be that. You, you want to make sure that it is something that they can easily grasp within the first three seconds and not overwhelming them too. So that, like, like one way that we do it is like those meme cards at the top. It could be like three steps to closing a million dollar deal. Right. And, and focus the attention on that. And you don't start talking until three seconds. Maybe it's showing you on the screen or showing a stock video or something. So because I've, I've had to learn this with my own content, I would make the mistakes is you, like you would have the three steps to closing a million dollar deal and you're talking at the same time and you have captions at the bottom. Mm -hmm. It's just like complete overload of information versus, right. hey, let's set the expectations with just text on the screen, three steps to closing a million dollar deal. Let them digest that and then get into that content. So you'll see people like Jay Shetty does this and a few other content creators will, they'll have this intro title card. Like if you're feeling depressed, watch this video or mm -hmm. before you break up with your boyfriend, watch this video. So mm -hmm. they're setting the expectation with the first three seconds to, okay, this is what I'm going to get. This is what the video is about. Am I interested or I'm not? And if it's compelling enough, and like you, you talk about like, if you're depressed or if you're angry, then watch this, like that reaches such a wide audience or like three steps. If you want to close a million dollar deal, like who doesn't want to close a million dollar deal? Right. So setting that expectation and then making sure that you're delivering on that expectation that you set forth. This is, this is great information. And this is, I think it's so important for, for our viewers or our listeners to, to grasp because I, you know, I think that you're bringing this, this mythical beast called <laughs> social media into the business world in, in a very different way for us. Let's just change gear for a moment. Um, I'm a great believer that we are shaped and formed psychologically by the parts of our lives that take place in the formative years. Um, many of us are crushed by what we get in our, in our, in our uh, formative years, and many of us are given wings. Many of us are given wings by being crushed. <laughs> so many of us crush our own wings. How has your childhood shaped who you are today? I think that, you know, one of the biggest things is, you know, growing up, I had a very <sighs> intense father at, that was a sports father that really pushed me very hard uh, early on to be successful in that in that way and you know obviously there's positive and, and negative effects of that but i think that one of the things that it just really dr drove me to be successful and to kind of learn because a lot of that pressure that was put on me actually had the reverse impact of it and and made me struggle to succeed in sports uh, instead of six you know to being you know winning and, and being successful in that way and i think that it's really driven me to, to learn as much as possible, improve myself as much as possible so that I can be successful in business. Uh, so I, I think that that was one of the, the driving factors. And, and also, I think from a very early age, I knew I was an entrepreneur. I can remember at like seven or eight going, taking my toys and trying to sell them to neighbors for their kids. <laughs> uh, so you know, looking back on that, I think that there was just always this innate ability or, or innate interest in, in creating uh, businesses or creating growth for myself. So can you share a little more about that, uh, that pressure, uh, from a sports dad? Um, cause you know, one of the things I'm, I'm, I, I really like to remind my, my listeners, my viewers, and even my clients of is the humanity of us all. We're, it's very easy to, to see, this guy, this, this Brendan Kane guy, he got a million followers in 30 days. You know, that's him. He's different than me. You know, he's a California kid. He's got the, you know, the blonde hair and, and he's worked in the movie industry. And, you know, and it, it, it's easy to see people in a snippet of time. This is the problem with social media. We see people in a snippet of time and then we, 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 we fill in all the, all the history and we fill in all the future and we don't realize the humanity. We don't realize that everybody in their own way has fought the battle. That's what I wanted to ask you about here because I want people to grasp this because, you know, we look at, again, you know, with social media, it's the most in, like it's in our faces, 
you know, people are famous for being famous, many of them. Uh, you know, and, and I always like to say, well, is that true? Or is there a backstory? You know, everybody screamed about Justin Bieber and about, you know, what a spoiled little brat he was. But if you read his story, like the kid is amazing. I mean, he practiced for hours and hours a day playing drums, became a talented musician and a talented writer, very, very skillful. Has he been a brat? Yes. <laughs> you know, has he done stupid shit? Yes. But let's not forget, he's not just been an entitled little shit. This guy's worked really hard. Yes, he made it when he was very young, but he worked very hard before he even got there. So I want to express that humanity. So that's what I'm trying to find out a little bit more about you because we can take yeah, a strip sure. and go, you, you know, here's this guy who's done a million people in a million followers in 30 days. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the so growing up in that intense environment, you know, having a father that was 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 very uh, very hard on me in terms of just kind of overall performance. And, uh, you know, I, I don't blame him for every, anything. And we have like a great relationship. He was just trying to do what was best and push me to my limits of, of being successful, not just in sports, but in school. I think that what that did to me is it created a significant amount of self-doubt in myself and always. And I, and I still, I mean, I've been in therapy for four years and constantly working on myself and improving myself and learning as much as possible to be the best person I can be. And I would say that that, that intense pressure and that father figure, I eventually took over on myself. You know, it's like, obviously once you graduate from college and you move on your own, you're on your own. It's not, your parents aren't pushing you or dictating how you live your life. No. And I took that, that, that role on myself and very early on in my career, I was pushing myself way too hard. I mean, I was working like 60, 70 hours a week. I put myself in the hospital and was just, uh, again, taking on that father figure. And I've been on this, this journey for a very long time of how do I love myself, understand that I'm good enough and that I, the, the work that I put in is good enough and, and not question it. Obviously, I still work hard mm -hmm. and I still have – and it'll always be a part of me that drives me. It's, it's never going to go away. It's just more about how you manage it, how you recognize it and how you deal with it. Uh, but that's what really fuels me. It's what fueled me to do the million followers in 30 days. And it, it's what fuels me to get a million followers on Instagram is there's this in, innate drive to prove to myself that I can do it. But also I just, what I really love to do is I love to figure stuff out, figure out how to do something and then share it with other people. Like mm -hmm. that's where my true passion lies and I think that that's kind of where I've taken kind of the hardship of growing up in childhood and, and turning it into a positive and recognizing it as a positive and, and obviously working on the parts that I need to work on, but also recognizing the gifts that I was given through that process as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, this is the thing I, I, I've talked about this a lot in my own work is that we all we're all very protective of our parents and we like to say, well, you know, my parents did the best they could, but sometimes that was a shitty job. They, sometimes they did do a shitty job and not because they were mean, horrible people. Cause I think there are mean, horrible people, but in the world, but there's not many of them. Most yeah. parents set out to do a decent job and, you know, and some of them make an absolute balls of it. But at some point we have to take personal responsibility and say, okay, it's on me now. And, and, and that's not about, letting your parents off the hook it is about uh, or, or making them oh they're all okay but really just being good with yourself and saying okay how do i turn this lump of coal into the diamond how do i turn this thing that was so potentially toxic into the thing that feeds my heart and my soul and that's why i really appreciate you sharing that with us what was it that catalyzed you specifically to get to the realization you know what? I need to go into therapy. You said four years now. So, yeah, I mean, I've tried therapy. I tried therapy early on and in, in, I think my parents put me in therapy when I was in like high school and I was in a little bit in college and I don't think that I was mentally prepared for it or could maximize right. the potential of it. And to me, like I am always, and it's one of the things that, that drives my success. I'm always looking for that extra edge and that's what kind of pushed me down the path of meditation and yeah. mindfulness and all of that. So I think initially I had the wrong intentions mm -hmm. of why I was doing it, 
because I was doing it to how can I get an extra edge to succeed? How can I get an extra edge to get more energy so that I can work longer hours? Yeah. And then it has shifted into more of how can I be a better person? How can I love myself more? How can I learn more about myself? How can I understand the struggles that I have so that I can learn to cope with it and I can learn to deal with it? Because I agree with you hundred percent. Yes. None of us are perfect and our parents or most of them try to do the best job. Yes. It doesn't take them off the hook, but there's nothing that can be done to go back in history and change that. Right. And now it's my responsibility to heal myself. It's my responsibility to figure out how I deal with the issues that I experience and, and the stress and the anxiety and the fears that I experience. My parents can't fix that. No. They can't go back in time and change their parenting. Yes, it, it sucks that that happened and that I have to deal with this, but we all deal with something. And to me, I, again, like the same way I do in business of figuring things out, uh, how to do things and, and sharing my story and my experience with them. I do that personally too. Like the, the experiences that I've overcome, the types of therapies I try, the type of meditations I try, I share with friends and people that I work with. Of course. Because as you know, in business, it's not just like the tactical business stuff. Like so much of it is the mindset that allows you to be successful. It is. So what was the turning point in your, in your philosophy, in your leadership and business philosophy? Oh, that's a great question. I think that very early on, as I mentioned, I was very impatient, but I was also, I, I was very hard on other people because I was being hard on myself. Right. And I, I approached deals the wrong way. I approached people the wrong way. I can remember it when I was doing my deals with MTV, aside from the executive that did the deal with me, I like, I was a terror to deal with, like with the other people. And they just hated me because I was just young, arrogant, arrogant kid. And I think that, you know, one of the, my favorite books of all time is Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yep. And I think that one of my areas of the reason I've been successful is I really try to understand who somebody is. I really understand, try and understand what their goals are, what their aspirations are, what their obstacles are, and really listening to people and understanding who am I dealing with, who's on the other side of the table, whether that's positive or negative, mm -hmm. and trying to provide value to them, trying to provide uh, insights to them. Like I don't go into any meeting. This is the reason like I close big deals. Like people ask like, well, how do you get Taylor Swift as a client? It's like, I don't go in and sell anybody on anything. Like I go in and I just try and understand who you are, what you're about and how do I provide the most strategic value to help you get to where you want to go. And I think again, starting out, I was very focused on me and focused on like, how do I do, how do I get rich? How do I make money? How do I be successful? Instead of like, how do I make other people successful? How do I provide the most value? How do I strategically help somebody grow? Mm -hmm. And I think that that mind shift has been one of the biggest, I'm not saying I'm, I'm perfect at it. I'm still working on it. But uh, I think that that was uh, kind of the, the shift that I had to make it both in my life and in my career. Fabulous. Thank you so much for sharing that. I really appreciate it. I appreciate your vulnerability and your openness to let us in on that. You've got... Um, You've had more than, I think it's more than 50 million people worldwide who've accessed the applications and the platform that you created for your celebrity clients. Like you were saying, people uh, who've used it are people like Taylor Swift, like Rihanna, um, uh, that turned uh, Facebook profiles or web, uh, into websites. Tell us a little bit about that platform, if you could. Tell us a little bit about how that works, because that's quite fascinating. Yeah, so... I had done several different licensing deals with MTV and one of the deals that I did is we had built this application and this was like, this was a while ago. It was like seven, eight years ago. And basically the platform, what it did is like it could dynamically write code for you. We could drag and drop anything on the screen and our system would write the code in the background. Now there's platforms similar to that, like Squarespace and Wix uh, out there now, but at the time we were kind of at the forefront of that. And we had structured that partnership with MTV because at the time they were into this thing called 360 management, where they were really, they had built these careers off of MTV and uh, their, their distribution outlets, but they didn't own any of the, the IP or the assets or generate any of the revenue. So they could build a Taylor Swift up leveraging their distribution channels, but they didn't share in any of that revenue. So it was a big thing in the entertainment industry at the time. And they saw our application as a way to build a larger business where they could start providing tools and resources to the musicians and athletes and celebrities that they worked with 
as a way to foster a stronger relationship and business bond with them. So this platform was one of them. And when we talked to Taylor Swift is, you know, the, the process was, was pretty amazing in terms of just even getting that deal. Like I had to meet with her manager first, then her father, then her mother, then her. And through each of those meetings, I started learning more about and listening of what were the different things that they needed. And from a business perspective, I learned that they had spent $150,000 in an all flash site at the time, looked at the analytics. It was like a 90% bounce rate off the homepage and people were spending less than 30 seconds on, on the site. So it was obviously not serving her. Now on the creative side, what I learned from Taylor is at the time, she really loved to be hands-on. Yeah. She would go in and respond to comments, take photos with fans, sign autographs. And with the flash site, it was very frustrating because it would take like two days to make a change. Mm-hmm. So what we did is in the business case, in the meeting, we built an entirely new site for her on our platform in less than six hours. And then going into that meeting, we sitting down with her, I showed her that we can change any aspect of it on the fly without writing any code. So literally in two minutes, we changed the entire homepage into something completely different based upon what she liked or her visual creative. And then from there, we really focused on honing and building that community because it was really important to her. And we, over the course of two years, and it wasn't just our platform, we we did other deals with other platforms to bring in social tools and community building tools. Uh, We took it from less than 30 seconds time spent on site to over 24 minutes, just building and fostering that relationship. And also what we saw that Taylor was doing is she was building these brand advocates that she was with each comment they responded to each photograph or, or autograph that she signed, she was turning this fan, not into a fan that was just going to buy her music and merchandise, but somebody who was now willing to promote her, her, her content and her brand with everybody. And because social media profiles are so ingrained in everyday teenager life, it was no longer that these friends were just sharing uh, her content music with three or four of the closest people around them. They're now posting it on their social profiles, reaching hundreds, thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of people. So the work that we did uh, with Taylor and then also led to Rihanna was how do we amplify that? How do we give these brand advocates more tools to push her content out there and her brand out there? And in doing our research at the time, we saw there was about 30 or 40 fans that were creating Taylor Swift fan sites that learn how to read and write code. And because our system didn't require the need to read or write code, we thought, well, what if we gave fans the power of the platform we just built Taylor Swift site on to them to create their own Taylor Swift fan site? And to make it even easier, we built an application that literally with a click of a button, we could turn your Facebook profile into a custom Taylor Swift fan site automatically for you in less than 60 seconds. And the way that worked is you choose from like one 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 of 15 different designs and when you click that button, you'd give us permission to extract your name and your photos and your bio from Facebook into this custom Taylor Swift design that you chose. And then again, once you got in there, you can change every single element of it. And you had the exact same tool that Taylor Swift had to build her website. Wow. So we went from about 30 or 40 fan sites to over 35,000 in just a few months, each That's one awesome. promoting her brand and her music and really engaging her fans. And Rihanna saw the success that we were having with that and had her record label reach out to us and be like, Hey, we really love what you're doing with Taylor. Can you create something similar? So what we did is when Facebook's timeline cover came out, the the image that sits at the top of your page, we created another system where we took all of album Rihanna's album artwork cover from over the years. And again, with a click of a button, we could insert your name and your photos into the album artwork and make it look like you had collaborated with Rihanna on her, on her album. <laughs> Ooh, smart. Yeah. Wow. And, and is that still something you're working with? Is that something that you're like some, if somebody wants to do that for an influencer or for a brand they can do, or is it something else now? No. So I, that company we, we, I sold to my partner like four or five years ago and it just, it's since shuttered because of the competition with Wix and Squarespace and all of that. Cause we were mo- more focused on that biz dev deal with MTV and Viacom. And right. it just didn't end up scaling from a revenue perspective in the way that we, en- we, we had hoped for. Hmm. That's a fascinating story. And that's, uh, and you're still working with celebrities and doing all kinds of those kinds of deals and, and helping them to build these, these amazing followings. And, and this has been incredibly insightful 
Uh, we're coming to the lightning round as we as we get close to the end here. So I want to ask you a couple of quick questions. Sure. Uh, first of all, um, what has been the most difficult inner demon that you had to battle? I think it's fear and anxiety around failure. Mm. What did you, is, is it therapy that mostly helped you with that or is it something else? I mean, it's therapy, it's meditation, it's, it's self-awareness, it's journaling. It's, it's a constant, it's a constant process to work on. I don't think it's one thing. It's, it's doing a lot of different things to really improve that. I agree. Thank you. What makes you cry? Like seeing dogs and animals being hurt, I would say, is one yeah. of the biggest things. Sad romantic movies make me cry too. So I'm <laughs> sad for those as well. Yeah. Do you watch This Is Us? No, I haven't watched it. Oh, man. I tell you, I, this, I, I certainly, at least in the first season, there was not an episode I did not cry. Yeah, there was an actor on that show that I worked with, Milo Ventimiglia, and I, oh, yeah? I haven't gotten a chance to, to see it yet. He is brilliant in it. Yeah, he's a great guy, too. Yeah, but I'm telling you, that that because he was in the Rocky movie as Rocky's son. People forget that. Yeah. But that, that is a great show. And like I said, uh, my wife would look over me at the end of the show. She goes, well, and I go, yep, they got me. <laughs> they got me. Uh, check <laughs> I, it out. I didn't hear anything. I go, no, it was a silent one, but it was, my eyes started leaking. Brilliantly done. So I'm with you. What makes you cry laughing? Oh, that's a good one. I, it's funny because I was watching this Instagram account last night of this wo woman that created an account for her dog, and this dog just terrorizes her. And it's like the funniest, it's the funniest thing. So. Uh, I mean, one of the funniest movies is Step Brothers with Will Ferrell and uh, Blinken and his other name, but yeah, just comedic movies and just funny viral social clips. Yeah, I like those too. What is, um, I believe real leadership requires courage. What's the most difficult leadership decision you've ever had to make? Well, to me, it's, and it goes back to the thing that I struggle with is that fear of failure and you have to push past it. And like, I'm in this process right now where I'm building my brand and I'm investing a lot of money into it. And it's very scary because I'm not in the direct attribution model. So mm -hmm. I'm looking at this longer term play and, and that, that self doubt and fear comes up, but you just got to push through it. And if you really want it and like, I don't have any choice, like I'm not going to go work a desk job. Like I, there's no way I'm going to do that. Like this is what I want to do. And it's just dealing with that fear and pushing past that fear to make the decisions that you feel are right, but may be scary. Mm, that's very good. In a parallel universe, what is your career? I think a <laughs> trial lawyer. I think I would have been a very good trial lawyer. Really? That's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. That's a million miles from what it is you do. That's fascinating. Actually, it, it, it is. Or it it's, seems. Let me phrase it. Because phrase. Like, I, I just realized I'm, I'm very good at distilling information down into very interesting and compelling stories. And I think it's the, sca the same skill set that the trial lawyers have. Hmm. That is very good. That's very interesting. I, lo I, love, I love it when you, you see that's one of the things I like about that question is there's always a correlation that is not obvious. Yeah, to, to us, but when but to you, you're like, yeah, of course, it's the same thing. So I, I love that. Yeah, you know, for, for somebody asked me that question years and years ago, and the answer was, I'd be a gardener, and I'm like, that's a million miles from what you do. And they're like, no, it's not. I grow people. Yeah, that's what I do. I grow people, right? And I and and I recognize that in order to grow a great rose, you need you need horseshit. So you actually have to you actually have to cultivate the shit that you've got to turn it into fertilizer to grow you. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a perfect parallel universe to me. I'm like, and that's why, I, and that's why I love my garden. <laughs> it's fascinating. So, um, in the, what did you learn in the last 24 hours? What's something that stands out that you learned in the last 24 hours? By the way, you're doing very, really good at this because I, I know this shit's like coming at you fast. No, no, I've learned so much every day. I'm just tying it back. I mean, I, I don't know if this is the past 24 hours, but it's something that I've been working on every day. And, and today is, is not anything different, but how to love yourself. Mm -hmm. Like that's what I'm working on is I just realized that I expend so much energy of trying to show appreciation and love for other people 
that I forget to do it to myself. And it's one of the constant things that I have to remind myself that I start my journaling every single morning as soon as I get out of my bed is reminding myself that I love myself, I love my inner child, my inner infant, the kind of the, the parts of me that I'm disconnected from. And uh, that is a healing process and a learning process that happens every single day right now. I love that. I love that. I was, uh, was at a meeting this last week. Um, and while I was at the meeting, I was standing around. It was a, a conference, actually. And I'm standing around with three other guys. And we're all introducing ourselves. And one of the guys is a client of mine. He's a very high-level uh, executive in one of the big accounting companies. And uh, he was saying that I'm, you know, he works with me, that I'm, I work with him, I'm his guide. And, um, and one of the guys says, well, what do you do? And I said, do you want the official or the unofficial? He said, I like the unofficial. I said, okay. I said, and I just, it was like, it was not thought about. And I said, I resurrect the, soul of, the souls of leaders. And That's he's like, I like that. <laughs> I was like, because it wasn't thought of, right? I mean, it wasn't yeah. like the right cliche thing to say. It just like, that's what it really is. And, and, it, and it's what you just said. It's, it's bringing home the disenfranchised parts of ourselves that are so scattered and shifted away because we have to create the appearance and the image. So I love that you brought up your inner child and your inner infant and all that. It's really wonderful. Um, in closing, as we get to the end, I, I always like to leave our audience with what is the one piece of practical advice that you would like to share with the audience that they could really take away and put into action today, whether they are somebody who wants to be an influencer or whether they're a pipe fitting company or whether they are a, a fortune 100 brand, what would you say is the first practical thing they can do in context of what it is you've been sharing with us today? I would say test and learn is understand that it's like anything in life is like you, you, you try something, you learn from it. You try something, you learn from it. You grow from that. It's no different when it comes to social and digital. It's just on a larger scale. And you have tools to be able to do it at scale. And just if, if something, if you put a piece of content out there that doesn't work, that doesn't mean that social media doesn't work. It doesn't mean that social media doesn't work for your brand. It just means you got to try something different. So that is, I think, the biggest piece of advice that, that I can give people. Thank you. Well, it's been a pleasure and an honor having you here, Brendan. Thank you so much for everything that you've shared. Please share with our audience um, how they can find out more about you and all the wonderful resources that you have. Sure. So the book is, an avail is available on Amazon and all major retail stores, uh, so they can check that out. Uh, they can learn more about me at my website, brendanjkane.com. So it's B-R-E-N-D-A-N-J-K-A-N-E.com or they can email me bkane at brendanjkane.com or direct message me on Instagram at Brendan Kane. Fabulous. Thank you, sir. That was awesome. Well, listen, I've really enjoyed our conversation. I hope you'll stay with us to the end. And uh, I want to thank you, dear listener, for tuning in. You can hang out with other conscious leaders and chat about this episode or any past episode by going to our Facebook page. Just look for Dove Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Podcast and find out how you can hire me, Dove Barron, as your speaker or strategist for your organization. Go to fullmontyleadership.com or fullmontyleadership.com forward slash consulting or speaking. As you choose, consulting or speaking. Please be aware, the research consistently shows that even the fastest growing companies face the same challenge. They're spending the money, the time, the energy, attracting, training, and developing top talent, also to have them leave at an alarming rate. If you're frustrated with investing in training and developing your talent only to have them leave before you get your ROI, then come talk to us at fullmontyleadership.com, where we provide the essential leadership skills to rekindle and amplify the hidden loyalty assets inside of your organization by tapping into purpose fullmontyleadership.com because you can't outsource authenticity. Also, stop by the matrix, matrix.fullmontyleadership.com. You don't need a triple W, matrix like the movie, matrix.fullmontyleadership.com and get your authentic leadership matrix self-assessment tool. It's valued at $197 value. It's absolutely free to you for being a, a viewer and a listener of our show. Thank you for sharing, sharing the show with everybody that you know. Until next time, stay curious, my friend. Stay curious about how your own bias about social media is getting in your way and how this is a future you cannot ignore and may actually be your greatest asset. 
You have followers who are waiting to follow you who just don't know you yet. Remember, the attention span is three seconds. Grab them quick and be real. I'm Dal Barron. I'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness to reach the next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. And I am out. Thank you.